Is he facing me or? No, oh, that's concerning. Some dude was in here. Did you think she signed up for Baller Rock? Who did she sign up for Baller Rock next semester? Yeah. Uh, correction, I still need to get that done. Right, yeah, you need to do that today if possible. Okay, so in other words, okay, who's, in other words I need to go for Fine Hamilton and send for some oats. I can get you into books for a second. Yeah, yeah. I, I just need you to bypass both of them. I should be able to do that. Okay. Oops. Alright, last time we're in the mini bar. Holy crap, it's one in there. What? Oh, I think so. No, 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 Get out, no matter how hard it try. So now go through the wall? Yeah. Could not go through the walls because we had some sort of uh, potential energy that was impending on the outsides. So today we're going to talk about a finite well where it's trapped like this, such so that down here we've got some sort of U, which we're going to call equal to zero. So U naught is equal to zero. So same with the infinite well, the potential at the bottom of this well is zero. And up here we've got it equal to u is equal to some uh, specific value. Actually, no, I should put the u not here. I think that, that your book uses it up here instead. So we just say u is equal to zero here, and u is equal to some value known as u not. Okay. okay, so there's two cases, right? Either the particle is trapped in there or it's not. Um, case being one, it has enough energy to escape. It's got an energy that's higher than the well. And this is just like a ball in the clip that can actually roll out. Or two, it can't. So we're going to call our energy level some height represented by a vertical line, E, like this. Now, most of the time, we're going to be talking about boundless states. And the boundless states are, of course, the ones where the particle is trapped in there. Can't get out. Can't get out. Okay. And we'll, we'll put this into some real uh, world explanation, too. So we're not just sitting here talking about these strange concepts. Okay. So let's write down our short version. All right, Kyle, which version of the Schrodinger equation did I just write down? just want you guys to be able to recognize the difference between these. And we always know that this is only one part of the wake. That's not coming out. Well, my T will get way too strong this week. Um, this is the time independent portion. That's the only part that we ever care about because it's the only part that is dependent on what's going on. That time independent part didn't even matter whether it's a finite well, infinite well, what the shape of it was, none of that matters. So are we using the time dependent at all? Uh, nope. So, no, not in this class. It potentially, you could use it for advanced applications in this class if we got farther. You'll probably use it in quantum when you want to start talking about where, like, in time something is. But for the sake of this course, I'd rather plow on with the time independent. So, can I assume I don't use the time dependent thing at all? Mm, I don't want to say that. We did it on the whole. You did need it because you did have to put the energy in there for it. Ha! Yes, you need it. Um, I have two. Two out of three, possibly four of your uh, questions on the test. If I put a fourth question, then part of it will be taken away. But right now, I've got relatively easy computational ones that don't require any new intervals. I'm considering leaving off the interval. Um, 
then to Ferb and then a take home. Yeah. 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 I don't have to worry about an after class and another 400 tests. For I prefer two to be honest, um, just because then there's. You need to work how you get the answers to us if Ferb should take home. I don't know. There's, there's lots of problems with take home. But sometimes it's unavoidable. So we'll see. All right. Anyways, so we're going to compute the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Yay. Now, I can rearrange this, and I'm going to rearrange this ever so slightly. Like this. Dollars already. What else did I get? Is that it? No, that'd be a point. Fine. Okay, 2 over h bar squared. Uh, and this minus sign, when this comes over to this side, switches the order of the u minus e, or the e minus u to u minus e. Everyone follow the little bit of algebra that just happened? Okay. Algebra. Yes, indeed. So now we have a second derivative is equal to the original function times some sort of quantity. Now, this is the part that's of interest, right in here. Now, we want to know whether or not this is a positive or negative number. Now, if this is a negative number, what does my side of x have to be equal to? Now, how do you know? Versus a positive number. Remember, this is doing the, the double derivatives. Well, certain functions, if this is a negative number, that means that this whole quantity is... It's, it's an exponential function of the positive sign. Sine if it's negative, or cosine. Um, any sine function can be represented as a cosine for the most part. Well, I shouldn't say for the most part. It can always, you just would have to add in one of those uh, phase changes or phase shifts, which would be obnoxious. So sometimes it's just easier to use a sine. Yeah, so exponential or sine. So whenever you have... D. All right, pick a letter here. B. B. D, B, D, X. Ooh, we're dealing with magnetic fields. Is equal to C, B. Um, if this is positive, right off the bat, we know that B must be some form of E to the X. Okay, and then you can have a different variable out here. Uh, you have R up here. Because the C could be a combination of whatever's up here multiplied by the R. Also, it's complicated. Okay. okay. Now, if this is in fact negative, then we know we end up with the sine. Because if you take the derivative of sine, you get cosine. Take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine, you get negative sine. So this is just something you want to hold on to, especially for the two of you that are in quantum next semester. It's always an easy way to tell if your solution is going right. So now the question becomes: uh, what, what does this being positive or negative mean? This is negative, that means that u of x is less than e. Okay, so it's unbounded. So if u of x is less than e, then that would mean that we are unbound. It's up here. Up here. Up here. Up here. Okay. Where did we this one? But I didn't write this one. Okay. Oh, right. That's fine. Okay. Now, when u of x is less than e, I'm sorry, when u of x is greater than e, now all of a sudden this becomes negative. That means that we're trapped in here. Oh, sad. So if we, when that happens, uh, then we're going to end up with um, sinusoidal functions. So in either case, we'll end up with that. Now we have a slight problem. What about when we end up over here? Normally, when we're here in the center, anywhere here in the center, we can say that u is equal to 0, and we just have negative e, and then we'll run through and we'll get our sine function. So for the bound states of, fine, of the finite well, u of x is going to equal something like a sine a to the x. Little a and big a. And I think your uh, book uses big a and alpha, but there's very little difference in Before, when we dealt this, when we had the infinite well over here, 
we had this was infinity. And we had infinity minus who cares equals infinity. And we took the second derivative of equals infinity. And we found out that this is a non differential function. And it was nonsense. The particle couldn't possibly exist in the walls. So now I want to ask questions about what happens when we're over here or over here on the sides. The simplest case would just be saying nothing happens because that's nonsense. The particle can't be in the walls. The problem is the math doesn't say that it's necessarily nonsense. According to the math, there's some value of, of this ux which is greater than e. Okay? That's it. That's all it's really telling us. But, okay, so if that's the case, this ends up being a positive number, and in theory, we have some sort of exponential. This would have to be the, the form ae to the, let's be more like negative ax out here, or something to that form. So up here, if we're outside of it, we have a nice sinusoidal, and we could actually think about it um, in terms of, um, let's combine the two. So we've got an infinite well out here, so we're going to have some sort of waves out here, do, 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 and then we even have waves in here that could be trapped. Okay? So you've got a finite well out of an infinite one. Totally possible. Uh, well, I don't know if it's totally possible, so totally mathematically uh, capable of being solved in here. But, now all of a sudden we have mathematical functions for this section here, and that's what we're going to try to do. Okay, so for in the walls, so does the width of the walls matter? The width of the walls absolutely matters, and we'll talk about why that is. So in other words, if the the walls cut off like right here, in other words, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes, it absolutely does matter. Um, so hold on to that. Okay. Now, that says it's an exponential, which is kind of interesting. Inside these walls, we've got these sinusoidal functions that look something like this. And outside, we have exponential functions. It turns out that that works out really well for us because if there wasn't a possibility of the particle being in the wall, there was no way that we'd actually be able to solve our smoothing of this function. Although I'm terrible at drawing these sinusoidal things, uh, we can see that we don't have smoothness at our boundaries. We don't go back to zero at the boundaries. There's no way we can. So we need to be outside of the wall to go back to zero. And this is where our exponentials can actually help us. Okay. So. Um, so inside, uh, in between, here in this region, we have this a sine a of x, okay, which I can actually rewrite as sine of kx, where our k from before is going to be equal to 2me over h bar. And on the inside, we're going to have some sort of sinusoidal function. Or, I'm sorry, on the outside, we're going to have some sort of exponential function. I suppose what I said is true. Now, there's an uh, interesting point here. These, right here, have to be differential functions. Okay, differential functions, and they have to be smooth, just like we said before. So that has some interesting implications when we look at the possibility of the angles that could be intersected there. In other words, if I've got this angle and it comes in like really sharply, like on the downside of the sinusoidal wave, this isn't going to work. The only exponential function we're going to try and get in here is not going to work and it's going to turn off like that. This is bad. Why is this bad? Well, you guess. Just below the well. What? Just below the depth of the well. Doesn't yeah. Smooth out. It doesn't smooth out, but why do we care about that? At the end of the day, once we find a function for any of this stuff, what are we going to do with it? What do you say? Yeah, you're 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 Yay, yeah, we're done with modern physics. Um, <laughs> we will integrate it with one more day. One more day. Well, and this guy said it's in a final. Mm -hmm. It'll be okay. Is that right there? No. You can tear me up all you, you can, yeah. Turn me a new one on the evaluation. But we, but we don't want you to get bad evaluations. What? We don't want you to get bad evaluations, though. 
Which you might. <laughs> we hit the class, not you. I wouldn't generalize to we. You're speaking for the whole class. The whole class might not agree with you. Five. All right. What happens at the end of this is once we get a function, we have to integrate over under the whole thing, and we have to normalize it to get one. Remember, the idea being is we have to find the particle somewhere. So we need some sort of function that can't disappear to infinity, positive infinity, or negative infinity. Because again, then all of a sudden there becomes a, now we're saying that the particle is infinitely likely to be over here, because the second we square this, remember this is just the wave function, this is going to go up to be positive infinity. So we need this to taper off in some way. We need everything to stay relatively close to zero, otherwise we can't normalize it. All right, so that one doesn't work. And then the other one that also doesn't work is what if we end up coming in too shallow? So if we come in too shallow such that we hit right here, our exponential is going to dip down, but it's not going to die up to zero because then it's going to take back off. It won't have actually gotten to zero if zero is down here. And then again, you have the exact same problem. There's a very specific angle that that's going to hit. Let's think about this as a, uh, as a wheel. It's just a circle. If you draw a circle, you could draw a perfectly horizontal line off here at any given point and draw a line like this. Okay, you could draw an exponential curve that is off of this, that connects, right? So if I wanted to draw it down here, I could draw it that way. I could draw one in either direction if I cared to, because the exponential is not going to go off as far as the circle goes. The whole point is that the only ones that we can deal with are the ones that have the exponential that die off towards zero. Every one of this is hitting another, um, uh, what do you call it, limit? I forget which word. What's the line called that you put it in? Asymptote? Asymptote. Huh, awesome. Thank you. Asymptote. But this asymptote goes off that direction and it doesn't help us any. We only can accept the ones that have asymptotes that go to zero. This asymptote. So that depends. So we need the sine function to end at a certain inflection point. At first I thought it was 45 degrees because it kind of looks like it is. So the sine of the function, when it's going up and down like this, has to make sure it hits at exactly 45, but it turns out it's not quite 45. I forget the name called for this. That was just eyeballing it. I almost told you it was 45 until I started going through more research, and it turns out it's not. Okay, so it has to be decaying such that that asymptote, I don't think I would have come up with that on my own, um, goes down to zero. Okay, so that's our criteria in solving all this. There's something else that is really, really interesting about this, uh, but before we get there, this is also requires energy to be uh, quantized, because in the previous state, where we had standing waves, it was nice and easy. We have standing waves, so the only waves that we can support in an infinite thing are the ones that kind of go up and down like this, and then we have three. Now that all of a sudden that we're saying that, well, no, it doesn't matter, I can have a wave kind of starting off the wall and coming out like this, Energy is still quantized because you can't put any wave in here. You can only put the ones in here that you can have exponential functions that die off outside, that have the asymptotes that go to zero. So even in the finite world, that's where we get a quantization of energy. Now, I'm doing all of this kind of on a high level and just kind of explaining what's going on. There is a large two-page derivation of solving this equation, which we're not going to go through. Don't worry. The pink thing? Uh, you will want to go to what? The pink thing? The pink thing. You're going to want to read through that, that pink thing, because I think you'll need it more in your homework problems. But we don't. Now you just then won't need it? I'll be impressed. Go for it. Wait, what? We, uh, I'll be impressed if you, if you don't need it. Well, we need the exam. You'll need it, possibly, yes. I mean, I, I'm just going to try another thing down for the exam. Anything I've done is better. Well, keep in mind I haven't written it, so I don't really know. Let's not put this on. But I will not put anything that I haven't given you in a homework assignment or an example problem that I told you about or we've gone through, which we'll go through one today. So there you go. All right. Onward. The other thing that's interesting is we have to think about what it means to even be in the side of the wall, other than you're in the wall, which is just weird. So we've said that we've got some sort of potential energy equal to mu not here, and we're saying that we have some energy level that doesn't quite make it. So there's some probability that I'm out here in the wall. Okay, so I've got some energy level that's E, which is less than the potential energy it took to be there. Okay. E necessarily always has to be whatever the potential energy is plus kinetic energy. Does wavelength matter in this? Yes, to some extent. Because wavelength is going to depend on what your energy level is. The smaller the wavelength, the higher your energy is. If you have a very small wavelength, you're less likely to be stuck in any wall because you're likely to be able to come out of whatever barrier you're at and be over top. So the longer the wavelength, 
which you can see right here, the longer the wavelength, the more likely that you're going to be trapped as well. So in that way, it matters. I'm not sure if that was your question or not. I'm not really sure what that's over before. So. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. K is less than zero. Negative kinetic energy. Now, I don't really have a great way to tell you how to feel about this. Negative kinetic energy, as far as we can tell, is a mathematical concept. Um, as far as measuring it and finding a particle, it's nearly impossible to do. The book, the book talks about it a little bit. It talks about trying to find a particle in here. The problem is on the scale of this size of finding the particle outside the wall um, is very difficult because the uncertainty of this, thanks to Heisenberg, might be much, much larger. So we might find a particle and really it was inside the wall in the first place, which doesn't give us any information. So trying to determine what this negative kinetic energy is is rather difficult. So you're telling me there's negative kinetic energy now? If it's in the wall, yeah. And what that means, I wouldn't worry about it. It means negative kinetic energy. It means negative kinetic that. energy, yeah. Um, it's a mathematical construct that requires uh, energy balance to still exist. What does this really mean? The other thing that we have to think about is, okay, so you're telling me I've got this finite well, I've got this particle that's going like this, so are you telling me that it's just it means going you have to have in? an imaginary number in there because when you square it, you get the imaginary number. So you get it, so it goes well. Exactly. So, um, but throwing more math at it, I don't think it's going to make anyone feel any better, but that, it's exactly correct what you said. Okay. Um, so the question I have now is, now with this new shape, what can I say about the particle being in the walls or being in the center? Is the particle going into the wall, coming back out, and flying back and forth? What is actually going on? Around one side of the wall. What did you say? Yeah. Like you're on one side of the wall, and you're not going to be going back. I feel like you're, you're not. not. You're absolutely not. So the whole point is that there's still this giant barrier here that you can't just ignore that. If the particle ends up on the other side of the wall, it can't come back. So we're going to ask, so it can go over here, and then it's stuck there, so then it has a probability of being one on the other side? No, this all relies on the assumption that you went and looked for the particle in the first place. Bad physicists, why do you go and do that? Uh, the point being is that this is the likelihood of where you would find the particle. It is a smear. It is a smeared space where you might find this thing. That smear happens to overlap in the walls. Now, if you go and bother to try and find the damn particle and you find it in the wall, it's just going to be stuck there going, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm here, I'm in the walls, I'm not moving. I'm not doing anything, I'm stuck here. Uh, then again, when you find it, and you find it not moving technically in the walls, um, your uncertainty in whether or not it was really there has to be large, because of the uncertainty principle, it's a big thing to plug. What do you got? Okay, so, if I'm saying correctly, we're saying that mathematically, we know where the that, that it could be almost set up, but it's not actually going to ever be in the wall. No, it actually very well could be in the wall, if you could go look for it. The mistake is to question how it got there. It's just there's a likelihood that it just existed there. Okay, can, I, can the particle actually go through a wall? Can it go straight through a wall? Absolutely, and this gets back to what we're going to talk about here in a second. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right, onward. Now, first thing we want to talk about, and this leads right into what David was talking about. How far into the wall could it possibly be? And this one is known as penetration depth. Yeah, okay. I'm glad it's an upper level physics course because it's not going to get any better from here. <laughs> so, we're going to show the equation for the penetration depth. I was fine when you looked at me. <laughs> There's a lot of, um, you can find a lot of crude humor on this sort of thing, and what we're about to talk about is puddling. Um, if you ponder physics things, it's, it's really high level stuff. We'll talk about it when they get to tunneling. So basically, you can calculate the um, thickness of. I'm on film. Never mind. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Now I wonder what the evaluation. Is. Oh, yeah. Rude teacher, but talked about. Yeah, this is not a sex ed class. Okay, <laughs> so penetration depth. We can take this. Is going to be defined by. That's what the triple equal sign means. One over a. This A is what was trapped in that sign that we don't have any idea what that actually is yet. Um, so we're going to have to get there. All right. Um, that's part of the wave function. But the A, we do know it. Uh, What's the point equal sign? Uh, is defined by. 
Right? So whenever they say that, in other words, this didn't exist until it was defined by 1 over a. Now a, beforehand, is a function of um, the e to the ax, and that's where this comes into. And um, in your book, you, talk some, uh, you can go through the derivation and actually come up with a sitter, and that's in the, the pink section. You'll find that a is going to come up to be h bar over square root of 2m u naught minus e. Okay, this is basically just what we had in front of the psi function to begin with. We said that, um, remember, we end up with this double derivative. It's not basically, this is what it is dx squared top. Ah, remember to equal some sort of uh, constant. We had the, uh, what was it again? Um, h bar squared over 2 m. And I've got it flipped. In any case, we have the constant c over here times the psi function. Now, this is going to be e of x. So, in other words, we have whatever's going to be up there has to make up this constant up front, which was the other part of the time dependent term. That's what this is, exactly that thing we did for the one assembly problem. So, here's our a. And we can say our penetration depth is based on the inverse of 1 over a. Why? Because we're taking e to this power. Okay? So, depending on how large this is, depends on how far this goes out. So in other words, we could have it such that if you land right here, we could have a really tiny uh, penetration depth, and uh, that's because our E function dies off really, really quickly. It just depends on how the sine function hits the walls there. All right. Okay, so now, when we talk about this distance, what happens when this distance gets large? And this leads us right to David's question. Well, it can be rather large at times. It can be such that we end up with this very large penetration depth up here. What happens if the material is rel relatively short? And all of a sudden, you look for the probability of finding a particle like this, and you have boundaries that are shorter than the wave function that you looked for. Okay, That means there is a statistical chance that you will have tunneling. Okay, this is in chapter 6, and we won't get to it. You guys will do it in quantum. And it's a very, very neat thing. It is the property that is likely to find the particle just goes to the other side of the barrier. Now, this is something that we can test, and we do test. It's really kind of neat. You're looking for an electron. I put an electron on this side, and now it's in this side. How did it get to the other side of the box? Don't ask those questions. So basically, again, if you think of the particle's uh, likely location, it's probably finding it as this cloud. So this cloud's moving along, do, 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 and it comes to a barrier. If the cloud is bigger than the barrier, it might just say, I didn't see a barrier. I just keep going. Because there's a probability that it was just on the other side of the barrier. Now, if this the probability function is smaller than the barrier, then there's no way that it can get across. Okay? Then that means that the probability has died off before it gets there. So it does matter. Now, here's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, light. We look at sunglasses and things like this that stop light to a certain extent. Okay, and they let light actually vibrate through the material and light can pass through other things, like lenses, things like this. Let's say you take a perfectly opaque material. No light can see through it, period. Okay, great. Light is an electromagnetic wave. We now know that. Electromagnetic wave or a particle, depending on, obviously, the, the situation. Of it can and will a little bit. Because what ends up happening is the electromagnetic wave has to die off inside the material. If the material is small enough, it goes... Do, do, do. Actually, I made it through. Okay, I'll just keep going. It doesn't matter if it's okay. It doesn't matter what the properties are of it. I mean, you can paint it as black as you want. Light will shine through it on the other side. Does that actually change the wavelength? Um, yes. Why? Because of the material. Why? What happens inside the change material? Inside the energy. Change the angle. Yeah. No, but what, what matters of inside the material? This is 2212 stuff. Do you guys remember Snell's law? Yeah, the angle thing. Yeah, but what is Sine. the matter? It's the N, uh, remember the index of refraction inside of material. Yeah, it changes the wavelength inside of material. I remember what you did that stuff. I'm pretty sure you hated everything I've ever taught you. It's the kind of what I'm getting at. It's the only thing I like because I like it just matters from the start to the end point. It doesn't matter what crap in between, right? Yeah, that's the neat part because then it goes back. Right, so if you pass it in in one wavelength, it goes, yeah, I'm. Weird. And then it goes back out the way it started. So to answer your question, no, it'll come out the same wavelength that it was on the other side, but it did change while it was inside there. Okay. In fact, because of this tunneling effect, it's going to go to the point that it's not even really a wave. It's going to be an exponential in here. 
and then goes back to being a sine wave when it comes back out. Neat trick. Okay. And that's the same idea. Remember we talked about we had a sine wave above the well, a sine wave in the well, and this exponential inside. So if it manages to break itself back out, then it goes back to being so a the first sine thing wave. I have to do with maybe something I do in geometry. Hmm. What? At the very last lecture of modern. <laughs> yeah, there you go, the very first one. Don't you get the going again? Okay. <laughs> now, next thing, if you guys have your book, I want you guys to look at a, a certain diagram. Okay, 515. We'll look at 515 for a minute. And I'm going to draw a new diagram that's under the mountain. 515. Apparently, let's go with this. Well, three. I actually have my book, so that's never happened. That's diagram. You don't normally have it? No. You're, you're so All right. Oh, figure 515 is on page 163. Uh, shows that, all right, here's our finite well, and here's our infinite well. Let's just look at the probability densities, which is the square of the, the probability function. Here, we say, all right, I've got this function here, and then I've got something that looks like, well, I'm doing probability, sorry, it's going to look like this. And then I've got one, also maybe up like this. Down here, these, all of a sudden, these are more spread out. And these become farther spread out. Why? Anybody have any ideas as to why? No, I'm just reading it. They look the exact same. Hmm. Look at the height. The height is representing the amount of energy it takes. Oh, okay. okay. This is energy vertically. In other words, the third state, n equals p state in a finite well, is going to be have lower energy than the identical well that has vertical walls, that has infinite vertical walls. Why? What do you got? Is it just because it's like. I don't know if you were this point, but if you're squeezing that function, then they can't extend out into the walls. Exactly. You can't extend out into the walls in this case at all. But there's something else that's of interest. Let's go. The equation that I have that I erased, the penetration depth is equal to h bar over square root of 2m minus e. I do believe it to make sure that I'm not making up equations. Yeah. Okay. It is a function of the energy that you have and the potential energy of the wall. Potential energy is not changing here, but the energy that you have is getting larger. It's getting larger and larger and larger. Okay. You're still stuck in the well, right? So no matter what, u naught is greater than e. We're in the we're in the wall. Okay. For this whole section, for this penetration depth, that's what this means. So u naught is always greater than e. But as E is getting larger, as you're going up into higher and higher levels, it is getting closer to mu naught. To the point that up here, let's say we're talking about this part right here, energy is really, really close to mu naught, yet, frick, I'm still stuck into the wall. If that's the case, this becomes a really, really tiny number. So what can I say about my penetration depth? It's really high. It gets really large. And point in fact, since you're dividing this whole thing by h bar to begin with, which is a stupid tiny number, this is inconsequential unless um, you start to get really, really close to the same energy levels. So, does that matter? It means that your tails get larger the closer you get to mu naught. So we'll take the limit as mu naught in mu naught minus e goes to zero. Right. So such that when you get to this limit, basically it's as if you can go just go right through the material because your tail is infinitely long. And in other words, if there's a tiny bit of material, uh, it's the equivalent of saying that your cloud is only kind of hampered by that much. Okay. So it's really not affecting it that much. So it's kind of a neat way to look at it. These tails are larger. So what does this have to do with the node spacing of this? Okay. And it gets back to what Drew said. If these tails are getting larger, that means n equals 3 has a tail that is farther outside than n2, and n1 has barely anything that's outside. In fact, n1 and n1 on both sides are going to be nearly identical. This, if we have a certain width L on both of these, these are standing waves. This energy is defined by the fact that this has to squeeze inside of here, and then this next one has to squeeze inside of here. All of a sudden over here, it doesn't have to. It can have a larger wavelength which equates to a lower energy. So if nothing else, you leave this class. I hope that one relation you go out here. Tiny wavelengths, huge energy. Large wavelengths, small energy. So can that be the only question? I think that. Okay. 
So the equivalent of this, the way to think about this is, you could write the finite well as having slates and walls like this, such that it is, it just has standing waves. It just so happens that the, the walls are getting farther apart. So basically, these are falling down inside the well. That's the way I mentally like to think of it. If you wanted to make them hard stop at the walls. Instead, they don't hard stop at the walls, and you've got a certain percentage of length with everybody out. So in finite wells, the energies are going to be closer together. The other thing that's really interesting is that in finite wells, of course, there's a maximum amount of energy that you can possibly have and still be a bound state. It turns out to be generally a very large number. I was going to have you try and calculate this in your homework, but it's not fast in any way. So you don't have to do that, which means it's not going to be on your test. But you can understand, I assume, the idea that there's going to be a limit to how many energy waves are actually trapped in here. And above that, then you escape. You're out. Yeah, or the right. energy gets above this. Okay. So you can set this basically to an E, E is equal to the naught, and figure out what energy level that is. But you can't just set it to it because then you're going to get an infinite number. The idea is you have to set it as the limit goes to that, and it gets back to a limit problem because this is in the denominator and it's messy. Mathematically messy. So we will skip that. Instead, we'll now move to case three. So if I put the percent, if I put the yes, harmonic oscillator. Wait, we're doing two sections today. I know. Do you do two least least favorite words? Yes. Why oh, you don't like this in pecan? I feel like we've both on this forever. I never liked the word. I never liked harmonic in the way of physics. I thought you liked the pecan stuff. I can't win with you, can I? Well, you're the one who said, oh, you took PCAM, just because it would be easy for you. And then it hasn't been easy for me, so. You, know, you did say regular. also said I'd do fine, too, and I'm. Oh, no, no. He said we're not going to take PCAM and this at the same time. Soon. He's like, don't worry, this will be easy, because you'll get there and take PCAM first. Well, you dropped out of PCAM, so. No, I didn't drop out of PCAM. No, we're going to have to set this measure. Make sure that's an extra point, though. They're all five dollars. Again, wait 15 minutes, and you can beat me up. Have all the opportunity in the world to scream and yell. <laughs> but it's this is normal. Unless we can use ready. Uh, you have your normal. Uh, I, I miss. Uh, no, I don't think I ever hear you. I just miss the usual pictures. Yeah. <laughs> because I was in a class of seniors uh, one time, and uh, at that point they don't care what they draw, so the pictures were really. Oh no, our class. I think that's a little fresh and salt more than waiting here. It helped encourage it. Encourage what? Drawing pictures that were not necessarily appropriate. Yeah, the funny thing is Sharon used to have to try and redo the pictures. Yeah. She, yeah. You have to at least describe them in text. Yeah. At minimum. Which I was a shame that... Yeah. I mean, I would like to see the originals. Okay. Harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator says the potential energy is equal to one half kx squared. You may or may not remember this equation from 2211, 2201. Basically, it says the farther you stretch this out, the more the spring wants to pull you back, the more the potential energy you have. So if we set this equal to zero, we can have negative x out here and positive x out here, and it's the same amount of potential energy because it wants to force you in the other direction. Okay. Also, it's convenient that this is going to be x squared, so that just works out well that it's identical. If we do a plot of this, it looks like these, a parabola, such that in this area, this is my potential. Okay. Does it not touch? And my energy, yeah, we can set zero wherever we want. So we can turn zero. Well, I thought it would be at zero energy when it's not moving the spring. Right. Well, again, when you do potential energy, you can set zero anywhere. It makes sense to set it at the bottom of the well. So we'll do that. That was a good question, but that could be confusing a little bit. So our potential energy is out here. We have low potential energy. It's the space in here is our potential energy. And it gets larger and larger, so here's our maximum potential energy. When our maximum potential energy meets our total energy, which we're presuming at that point is zero kinetic energy, then that's a turning point. When E equals mu, this is necessarily a turning point. And I don't even care what you're talking about. If you're talking about electric potential energy, gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy, basically saying when my total energy that I had reaches a, the total gravitational potential energy, it's the same. That means I must not have any kinetic energy left over, and then I have to turn around. So it's always a turning point. All right. So, now, we 
could model a box on a screen like this, but there turns out to be a very real world example that will apply to this, and it's a diatomic molecule. I mean, chemistry in all my courses, we just had the uh, past two days of uh, calorie, calorie tree. See, I didn't like that. Think about that. I don't think it will be. 22 to 11, no, it's going to have to be. Yeah. All right. See, Campbell doesn't get to teach all the fun stuff. All right, here's our diatomic molecule with a spray. Now, this is very similar in the sense that if you try and compress it down, it doesn't like it. And if you try and stretch it apart, it doesn't like it. It doesn't want to be stretched in either direction. So the true plot for the harmonic oscillator is going to look something like this. All right, in words, um, can anybody explain to me what the heck is going on here? What do you got? Uh, when it's at zero, it's at positive infinity. Uh, as you start progressing, it's so the string, or excuse me, the uh, spring starts to expand out, it'll reach lowest point, so the uh, minimum, and I assume that's going to be, what do you think in this case, that's energy, and is the bottom, how far apart is the screen is expanded out? No, this is just an energy. Okay. So we've got, uh, we've got potential energy underneath here, and then we can represent the energy wherever the particle has above here. Would that be rest energy? This is the lowest amount of energy that the particle possibly could have, and it's still going to have some uh, kinetic energy. But we can, if we cared to, we could write this again and set, let's go ahead and we can set mu to be zero there if we want to. So at that point, I want to do that. Okay. So at that point, that's when there's no potential energy going on. Right, that's the happy location, which is known as a local maximum, where the ball is just sitting there with the two diatomic are there and they're not pulling in either direction. This is their happy location in the way they're connected to the spring. And then as you keep going out farther, it just reaches a plateau at some point. So no matter what you do to the spring, it, it's not going to change its potential energy. Right, and in fact, in, depending on whether or not how the spring works, sometimes you can have this die off this way, or sometimes you can just reach a plateau and it reaches an azimuth. Um, the point being is that you can get to the spring to the point that you can stretch it out and you can break it apart and all of a sudden now there is no more potential energy to pull it back in. You have enough energy. This becomes basically level, which is to say that your potential energy is equal to your, uh, equal to your energy and it doesn't matter. You can just float all around. There's no energy that's pulling you inward or outward. You've now escaped your uh, bound energy. You've escaped your bound state. Just like a ball that is in here, if you drop a ball from here, it's going to get up here, and then once it gets up to this point, it's just going to roll on forever at a constant speed. There's no potential energy that's pushing it away, none that's pulling it in, in the simplest case where this just goes to zero. Okay? So, the other direction, this is saying it doesn't work that way with the other uh, squeezing together. This isn't jelly, you can't just go, go. No, <laughs> there is infinite energy at a certain point. You can't just smash two nitrogen atoms together and go, Limit. There is a limit to that. Um, so it eventually gets to infinity. Now, the important part is in this region right here, this region right here can be perfectly modeled by the harmonic oscillator. Same thing as box on a spring. Okay, as long as we're inside that area. So as long as we're talking about bound states, areas that are down here below this, uh, that will be fine. And we can model it as such. So that's what we'll do. Easier now, so you probably relinquish that duty. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try and solve one of these functions. Okay, so what we're going to try and do is we're going to go through example 5.3 and actually solve this function. For the harmonic oscillator. 5.3 reads, for a simple harmonic oscillator, a spring constant of k and mass m, the solution of the Schrodinger equation is the form psi of x equals ae negative a x squared. 
So it's slightly different because it's x squared as opposed to the square walls. And that's just because we're dealing with a parabola, which is an exponential function as opposed to a linear function. All right, Gaussian centered method of origin. Yeah. Determine the energy in properly normalized wave function in this state. Okay. So actually, let me erase all of this. We'll start over here on the left. So two things we want to know is what the entire properly normalized wave function is and what the energy is. We can probably start with the energy. Okay, so we want to what energy of something is inside this harmonic oscillator that's stuck in it. So let's start off with our time independent Turing equation. And I'm going to remember all my two, so just watch. told us that the solution to this thing is equal to a e minus little a x squared. So we're just going to go ahead and trust that. I do believe in your homework I make you actually prove that. So we're going to have a sub of x all of it e of x. We got a two. Damn it. Wait, function e of x. <laughs> what? Right about what? That was going to mess it up again? Huh? No, not even like <laughs> You should have given your picture. Oh. Okay. Now, <laughs> now we're going to rearrange this in some slightly. So we have to throw this in here. And it's going to be this big, ugly thing that we have all of these uh, uh, values in. So when I put this in here, it's going to go in here, it's going to go in here, and it's going to go in here. Let's just deal with this section right here first. Because I have d squared dx squared now of a e minus a x squared. Let's deal with that first and then we'll put it back in the equation because otherwise it's just going to get long and messy. So I need the square root of this, not the square root, the second derivative. Alright, this is going to be equal to the first derivative of whatever the derivative of that was. Now does anybody remember what this is, the derivative of e to the x? Uh, x is the same thing multiplied the derivative of Yes, so if we have the derivative of negative a to the x, but the problem is we have got the squared up here. So that makes it slightly confusing. So if we take the derivative, it's just whatever the derivative of this is, so I end up with a times negative a. In fact, this, just take this sucker out of the front. He's never going to be helpful. He's just going to be in our way. Let's get rid of him. So I'm going to have negative a, but I'm going to have whatever the d dx of this is. I have to do it by parts which in this case is just going to be 2x times e to the negative a x squared. Does everyone follow how I did that first step? Okay. Now, we have to take the derivative of that again. Problem is, I've got x here and I've got x here. Let's take the derivative of x here first. That's nice and easy. I just have negative a two e to the negative a x squared plus whatever I'm taking the derivative of what's up top. Did you follow that? Okay, now I have to take the derivative of what's up top, and that's going to be uh, negative a two x times negative a 2x times e to the negative a x squared. Do we have to give it one with that? Um, Just leave the derivative over there. This is not... We can take the derivative of this, can't we? Mm -hmm. Might as well spin up on my test right now. You can take a derivative. You can't take the derivative of e to the x. It's been a long time. Well, that, long what, long. That's like taking the derivative of g of x times f of x equals to g prime of x. It's not the chain rule. Which I haven't done since my freshman year. So. If it's not identical. No, I understand. You can't just put have it on the test unless it is identical to this okay. and specifically having you solving the harmonic oscillator. Okay. Now, let's combine all this stuff. It's really not that terrible. This is going to be well, a. We have this e to the negative ax, and this thing becomes something screwy. Let's figure that out. So it looks like we've got 
uh, negative 2a, and then this is going to be a plus. What do we have over here? We've got 4ax squared. 4 a squared, x squared. Can you leave out the negative negative? I'm getting that. Because I can write it like that. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 She's so excited to find it. Now, your review this in the book. Your book doesn't give you this many steps. It basically just ju jumps to right here. Actually, it doesn't have the A in the book at all. It has a H bar squared, blah, blah, blah. What's, oh, it doesn't even use A at all. Nope. It's just using up all of that. Well, that's messy. We'll use that in a little bit here. All right, so now I'm going to erase all this other stuff that I had over here. Sorry. We do have to make a couple of shortcuts of crap when we're running out of time. It's fine. Okay, so we put all this stuff back together. We're going to end up with, now we know that that is what our second derivative is. So we end up with negative h bar squared over 2m times negative 2a plus 4a squared. Well, once we ended up here in the end, we still had this function right here, and we still have that everywhere else, because it's still our side function, it's exactly equal to this. Remember I pulled the a out? Yeah, the a, this combined with the a that's up front that I just pulled out. So that cancels in every single one of the terms, and this is all we're left with. Now, this is where it gets really important. Um, ostensibly, we're saying we're done. This is the energy function. Great. And I wouldn't necessarily expect you to go farther on the test on this, because you're like, well, I did. I saw for e, that's what e is. But if we rearrange this equation, we can actually get a better answer for e. Okay. Um, I wouldn't expect you to blindly see this, so don't worry. Okay, if I rearrange this as such, that equation in a very unique way. What's the point? Well, the point is this has to be true for all locations. Okay, this is just a function that is true for all locations, this equation. Uh, in particular, let's look at the example where x equals 0. So the harmonic oscillator, when we're at the bottom of the well, we're right at that bottom point. If that's the case, this still has to hold. Well, this is 0, then this whole term goes away, and then we've just got this equal to 0. That necessarily means that E has to be equal to h bar squared a over 2m. Or over m, sorry. Yeah, and we, know, we can throw in with a, the h bar, and all that other junk that we've got. Now, what about, all right, if that's true, let's plug this back in, and then this whole term just goes away, and then I'm just left with this term. So when x is not equal to 0, then that means that 2 h bar squared a squared over 2, or over m, must be equal to 1 half k. So this variable for k we have, which in this case is the spring constant, or really it's our bond strength constant for the diatomic molecule as it bounces back and forth, however strong it is. Okay. Now I can solve this for then for a. And get the a for this problem is equal to square root of mk over 2 h bar. And therefore, if I put this back into e for what I've got for a, I can now say that e is equal to h bar over 2 times the square root of k over m. Now, the square root of k over m, this should be similar. Or that should be familiar to you for the harmonic oscillator. We saw the square root of k over m back in 2211. And 2212, for that matter, when we started talking about. So it can be distilled down like this. OK, now the last thing to do is to normalize. Because the other thing is said that we want to normalize. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to skip that. Yeah, I'd rather have you guys just read through that section so I can give you guys some time to do that on the questions. All 
All right, so I will tell you what you have to do. The idea of normalizing is we have to say that finding the particle from negative infinity to infinity of psi squared of x squared dx has to be equal to 1. So in this case, we're just going to put this back into our function. We now know that our function is equal to a e to the minus a x squared dx. Exactly what we just saw. Uh, this is what we started with. They told us this would be the answer. We now have a value for a, which we just saw for up here. So now all we have to do is figure out what a is here. Yeah, fuck it. We're just this for sure. Two more lines. Sir, let's forget the probability. Yeah, it's kind of what we did. Which one? We which thought for the cost of the final. Yeah. All right. So I'm pushing all that through. Um, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative cx squared is equal to pi over c. This is just a standard rule of integrals. It's nice and easy. If you integrate all of the exponential function, this is what you get. Neat. Okay, so I'm going to be integrating this e to the negative ax squared, so I know that I'm necessarily going to end up with a function that just looks like 1 is equal to a squared times pi over 2a. Everyone still following me? Well, uh, where does the a squared come from? There's yeah. no a squared. Oh, capital A squared. Um, this right here. This whole quantity, sorry, guys over here, this okay. had to be square over here. I forgot to bring the square over. Oh, the size squared is this whole function squared in dx. Okay. So if we go over here, we end up with a squared equals this. So a is equal to uh, 2a over pi to the 1 fourth power. Now, if we plug in what we know a to be, little a that is, we end up with this weird thing, mk over pi squared, h bar squared, over 1 a. Ta-da! And we can put that back into our wave function now that we know what a is. And now that we know what capital A is and little a is, we can put all that back in to get our psi function. Psi of x is going to equal the very ugly mk over pi squared, h bar squared, to the 1 8, e to the negative square root of mk over 2h bar times x squared. And I see no reason why you can't reproduce this whole thing. I must. I can't. You almost got triangle. No, I'll just be using the results of this. I want you guys to see where it comes from, but I'll be able to use the results of it. Okay, first your homework. You're here to tell me what you have to do. That seems like a bad idea. Yeah, okay. 